I really appreciate that, Stormy. And it's so true. Every time you come to an Aspen event, you know that it's teamwork uh, that makes the dream work. So also on my, from my side, thanks to Emma and Molly and this entire incredible team, Katya and others who I've worked with for so many years. It's really a joy. And you really keep this machine running. And to our audience at home, because I was at home watching this entire conference. So now I know, as I said to Stormy, that Terry Martin is buying controlling stock and SAP. Um, you know, those are the kind of things you can learn even when you're at home. So even if you're out there in the hybrid format, you're no lesser of an audience member and in this discussion. And here, fundamentally tonight, you will get to vote because this is a discussion about promise versus peril. So the idea what, whether, and this is, these are the questions you have been debating all day and you have an opinion in your own mind, but what we're going to try to do this afternoon and the early part of this evening is potentially change your mind or give you a nuanced, granular opinion of how you might think about how technology is going to change our every lives. And the good news is I don't have to do any of this alone. In fact, I am a glorified timekeeper up here because what we're going to do is an Oxford-style debate. And any, any Oxford alums in the audience? Yes, any, any debaters? Okay, so we have a, now the only difference to a regular Oxford style debate is these are new teams. They did not meet at Oxford, they did not eat at the Union, they are not already sworn uh, teams. They have found themselves over the last couple of days and weeks uh, and they are putting their, you know, their, their pedal to the metal, as you will, for this discussion. So if my teams could come up and join me and I will introduce them to you as they come on up. Okay, so as I said, we're discussing, oh, yes. Well, let's have the pro side over here and the con side over here, if you can remember what side you're on. Haha, <laughs> see? Right, so the advances in technology, can they propel our societies toward the better? Can they create greater equity and access to, in, in terms of democratic uh, access, in terms of democratic equity, and change the way in which we form our political choices? Or possible peril, are we, should we, must we control developments in technology and the impact on our lives because they will curtail our capacity to compromise, to interact, to be human with one another? And if so, how do we do it? Regulation, import controls, breaks in technology value chain through better education. You're going to hear it all tonight. Uh, and I want to just go through my teams. They will, in Oxford style, um, we'll have you vote on the questions they're debating first. So get your Slido apps out now. You've been working this all day. <laughs> and you can also do this from home, I am told. Uh, and we'll read the questions to you in just a moment. As I introduce the teams, you can get to voting. Uh, I have on the right side here my pro team. The pro team thinks, believes as the fundamental unifying thought that new techno technologies, AI, quantum, and many of you will have watched a delightful press conference from San Jose, California yesterday with the CEO of NVIDIA who thought that beyond the metaverse, we will get to a place in which through AI we just say the word and it appears in 3D and we will see the images before we manufacture them and just think of how beautiful or not that world might be. So my pro team here will argue new technologies have great potential and will enhance open, just, and democratic societies. So that's question number one on your Slido, question number one. You can start getting to voting as I introduce these folks. Question number two, other side, our con team. New technologies such as AI and quantum computing and biotechnology and anything else pose a risk to open, just, democratic societies and could easily undermine them. So you can get to voting and I will let you know who is with us today. So on the pro side, and this is the order in which they will go, so don't be surprised with how I introduce them, is Lorenz Lehmhaus. He is associate partner at IBM Consulting. Lorenz, say hello. 
Uh, Anna Giovinizzi, she's the CEO and founder of Adalan AI. Hello, Anna. Carolina Lindekamp is project lead of No Fake Corrective, Corrective uh, and does is part of a journalistic um, new, sort of new format conglomeration and does research on society and technology. Carolina is all the way on the outside. And then Yuri Schnöner, Schnöner, co-founder, managing director, Cosmonaut and Kings, of course, a uh, often seen face in Berlin circles. So on team two, we have Mauritius Don. He's a senior digital policy and educational manager at ISD Germany, uh, an increasingly known face to those of us who follow these debates on TV. Alexandre Gomez, all the way to the outside, research fellow at the Klingdale Institute. Doug Kreiner, who is the Clinton Rossiter Professor in American Institutions in the Department of Government at Cornell University, so come a long way to be with us. And then last but not least, the star of our debate, because Molly literally um, found out that she was joining this debate about, you know, 32 minutes ago, <laughs> the program officer of the digital team of the Aspen Institute, Germany. So we have a very tightly scheduled uh, debate. We're going to do it classic style, which is to say we have 16 minutes to open this conversation. And as we do, and by the way, their bios are extremely impressive, so please continue to read as you listen to what they say, what forms their opinions. I'm not reading them out for expedience of time. Um, we will go team by team. We will time and uh, we'll call time. But I need to first give you five minutes of full voting time. So if you voted already, wonderful. Um, and I will filibuster a little bit for the next eh, about four minutes as, as you continue to vote. And we'll close voting as we move into this. So how we're going to do this is the pro, time, pro team will move through all of their opinions. At first, I thought we were going to ping pong just to confuse you entirely, but we're not going to do that. The pro team will go in their entirety, and then the con team will go. Yes, teams, mm. good, right? So Father still look, look at how diplomatic this is and how, <laughs> how happy they are with one another. And this will, this will last for another 16 minutes, and then they will be throwing darts at one another. So as you make your final choices, I'll remind you of the questions. The pro question is, uh, new technologies such as AI, quantum, we could go down the list, you've heard them all today, have a great potential and will enhance open, just, and democratic societies. Team two, and you need to vote, new technologies such as AI and quantum computing pose a risk to open, just, democratic societies and could easily undermine them, okay? So you know about another two minutes to do that. And as we do that, let me just run quickly through um, what brings these people here today. So Lorenz Slimhaus, as I mentioned, is an associate partner in the IBM, or is at IBM Consulting, but has had sort of an in, inside out perspective. He previously worked at the defense industry and in signals intelligence, electronic warfare, was a reservist in the German Armed Forces where he led innovation projects and unmanned systems, and then joined everyone's favorite German pet project in this space, Aleph Alpha, where he spent three years as, as head of communications. So welcome, Lawrence. Anna, as I mentioned, she's the founder and CEO of Adlan AI, building end-to-end -end solutions for AI governance, and is the founder of the nonprofit organization AI Governance International, and a founding editorial board member of Springer Nature's AI and Ethics Journal. So she thinks about it similarly to Carolina, also from sort of a journalistic angle and investigative angle in terms of what could this mean going forward. As I noted, Carolina is the project lead at No, Fa no Fake at Correctif. It's an interdisciplinary endeavor that focuses on looking at innovative strategies to counter disinformation. She has a really interesting team there, scholars, developers, journalists, bringing, and this is a new word for me as an old hand journalist uh, with a former dial-up connection, methodologies from pre-bunking and debunking, so before and after um, sort of disinformation gets constructed, leveraging civic tech to tackle the challenges posed by misinformation. And finally, Yuri, uh, as I noted, managing director of Cosmonauts and Kings, held positions in the campaigns of, now get this, Chancellor Merkel, President Obama, you'll realize there was a little bit overlap there, he'll tell us what whether or not that overlapped, and EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker. 
and in 2021 published the Public Arena Playbook, a hands-on, first-of-its-kind publication on political communication in the digital age. So that is your team pro. You have exactly 35 seconds to continue voting. And I'll continue with our con team. So Mauritius is the Senior Digital Policy and Education Manager at ISD, which many of you know well, coordinates the digital policy recommendations and leads Project AHEAD, <clears throat> an independent information dialogue series aimed at policymakers uh, and academia and civil society. And he taught because we talked about education, as an educator in the Business Council for Democracy on hate speech, disinformation, and conspiracy narratives. Maybe not a huge surprise, he's on the cotton team. <laughs> Alexandra, uh, all the way to my far, far left, is a researcher at the Klingdale Institute, focuses on geopolitics of technology, digitalization. As I mentioned, do we have a split in the tech space? Will we have a split in the tech stack? Those are the kind of things that Alexandre looks at. His research revolves around the intersection of mutual influence between geopolitics and technology. Douglas, right next to him, as I noted, the Clinton Rossiter Professor in American Institutions uh, at Cornell. His teaching and research focuses, of course, on the American political institutions, deeply plagued. We have a really interesting lawsuit in front of the Supreme Court right now <clears throat> on disinformation, whether or not that should be part of the political gambit, and I'm sure he'll talk about that. And uh, has written a number of books, his most recent, The Myth of the Imperial President, How Public Opinion Checks the Unilateral Executive. Great. That, I really look forward to reading that in this particular year. And then finally, last but not least, Molly, our program officer in the digital team at Aspen, where she manages a lot of programs, including this incredible conference with an emphasis on AI regulation, cybersecurity, and digitalization but she comes at it with a long perspective on public affairs, consulting, communications for everyone in Washington, including the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, State Department, and Pfizer. Okay, boom, you're done. Voted, yes, good, fabulous. We exactly hit the clock. Well, I'm so happy with this. All right, so let's go ahead and see the results. Can I see them here? I hope you can see them. <laughs> I, it's do bidi bidi do. Oh, sorry. All good. Yeah. Ah, maybe. Ah, so a good ausgangslage. There we go. I just need the results. Oh, no. No, no, doch nicht. God, scheiße. They're also behind you. Also behind me. Oh, even better. Oh, fabulous. Oh, look at all these techno optimists. Okay, team one, you have a very easy no, no, no. job. <laughs> no, no, oh, is it the other way around? Yeah. Oh, see, it would help if I didn't have this enormously strong shoulder. Mm. All right. Okay. okay. Well, sorry. <clears throat> sorry, team one. Okay, we've got it. Oh, I, all, all hype and no result. Okay, well, <laughs> the thing is you have 35 minutes to change everybody's opinion. That's the good news, right? Okay, so let's get right to it. Lawrence goes first. Each of our panelists get two minutes. So that's why I said I'm turning into a glorified timekeeper here. So if you see me making faces, and we also have a bell in the audience because the Aspen team does not roll without a bell, I just learned. Um, so there you go. So if you hear that, you're over time. Um, but these people have all been busy preparing. So Lawrence, without further ado, the two minutes are yours. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, honorable opponents, uh, today we will uh, sit and stand at a crossroad of history. The march of technology intersects with the fate of our democratic societies. Born and raised in the Rhineland, I'm an optimist, but more so I'm a firm believer in the potential of emerging technologies to uplift, empower, and transform our world for the better. Let's face it, the genie is out of the bottle. Um, no matter how hard we try to grasp it with some sort of legislation, uh, it just slips through our fingers like sand. Instead of condemning uh, these groundbreaking technologies, as the steam opponents on the other side will uh, pose, let's focus on the positive impact they already have today, particularly with countries that champion them. Uh, take Ukraine and Taiwan, two young democracies using technology as a shield and sword, providing a lifeline and enabling them to stand firm against authoritarian threats. They understand the power of innovation and defending the very fabric of our societies. Our rivals, they scoff at rules and regulations, exploiting every crack in the system. Do we really want to be left behind while they march forward with supremacy? 
In a time of division and discord, emergent technologies offer us a common goal, a shared vision of progress and prosperity. Yes, and I'm sure the opponent group will elaborate on these aspects. There are risks with these emerging technologies, uh, which we cannot foresee at this point in time. So dear audience, dear opposition, let us not be swayed by fear-mongering and sensationalism. Let's stick to the facts. Let's trust in the power of innovation, knowing deep down that the benefits of emerging technologies far outweigh the risks. Thank you. Excellent. That's, that's a man who's practiced. All right. We're moving this at a clip. So, Anna, you're next. You get your two minutes. Stand up. And oh. <laughs> off we go. Oh. Um, hello, fellow uh, tech optimists or non-optimists. Well, actually, uh, in real life, I've switched from this table to this table in the last couple of years, and I'm going to tell you why. Well, major reason is like kind of um, high level, because I think in general, no matter what it is, it, whether it's AI, whether it's technologies, nothing you do has to be rooted in fear. Everything, if we, if we want to do something, we want, want to achieve th something, we have to move on the opposite side. Something that is rooted in a courage. And all the risk and all the safety and all the, um, all the entire AI governance field that is basically focused on the risks of AI is rooted in fear. And also, you AI act that has been the immediate reaction to AI innovation, I think is also rooted in fear and a result of the fear. And that's why I believe that this um, regulation does not have a good um, promise of the impact. And so, moving from that, um, and from my experience building the startup in AI governance and meeting, uh, starting from also, I have, um, I have to admit that I've been doing fear mongering. I've been working on a risk side and trying to work with the companies and convince them how risky AI is. Then I saw a lot of, um, a lot of excitement about the technology and, and a lot of courage and, and a lot of um, desire to innovate this technology. And so um, this was basically sort of uh, something that infected me in some way and um, made me see how, we, how I explain and how I see uh, today. So um, I think if we want to assess and see risks, the risks, risk measurement and risk assessment has to be rational. Again, rational and rooted in encouragement and rooted in courage rather than rooted in fear and fear mongering. So this is all I wanted to say. Excellent, right on the money, thank you. Carolina, you're up next. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm involved with um, uh, countering disinformation, um, also through AI, not only. I've recently been to a conference where someone said what we're facing now, introducing into earlier generative AI into the int uh, information disorder, would be like Google Analytics on steroids. So, of course, these words trigger reactions, for example, similar to what we've been seeing in the survey, maybe. Um, however, um, um, I've also, I'm only working with technology for two years since I entered Corrective in the project I'm working on. And um, I mean, innovation is there, technology is there, and we don't want to stop it. And instead of just denouncing it or avoiding it, I think we should very much look into how can we actually use it um, according to democratic values or when we're talking about countering disinformation, also according to journalistic standards. Um, and I think journalism and also other fields also already provide quite a lot of positive examples on how we can actually... Um, apply them according to our standards, um, especially in um, fact-checking organizations. There have been a lot of examples um, for cross-country um, cross um, collaborations to form databases, to train um, AI in a meaningful way so that we can deploy it to actually counter this information. Um, maybe later there will be a chance to mention some of these examples. And then the other thing that I would also um, like to point out, it's important that we look into how can we call those who have most data who have the power, who are pushing these technologies forwards to account for the responsibilities. For example, talking about the, um, the big platforms. And um, like what I learned, like working in a tech project for two years now is actually to not talk so much about artificial intelligence, but rather um, talk about machine learning and deep learning. Because I think um, artificial intelligence, um, the term always gives us a feeling, okay, you need to be like a real expert to get into it. But when we talk about um, uh, machine learning, we know there's data data behind and there's people behind who are responsible. So they should actually account for these responsibilities. Excellent. Thank you.
Everybody has practice, let me assure you. Yuri, last but certainly not least, the floor is yours. All right. Um, well, two thirds said it's a risk, so I want to address you directly. How did you come here? By car? By a train? Watching on your smartphone the latest news? All of those inventions were made by people that didn't see just a risk. They saw a possibility of pushing humanity forward. And I think that's what's at stake right now. Um, we are, of course, at a crossroad, be it AI, quantum computing, disinformation, Terminator-style uh, uh, propaganda, where potentially we might be exterminated by a strange alien and I, that we see a lot of risks. And I think it's important to address and accept, yes, there are risks, because human history is never a positive or a negative. It's always an incremental change towards a better future. If you look at today's numbers, there was never a better time in history to be alive than right now. And still, there's a lot of work to do, a lot of poverty, a lot of people still living in fear in unfree societies, a lot of fear about the future, about our climate, if we actually uh, mess this up and might not be able to save the planet for our children and for their children. And I think it is an insult to the next generations on this planet to think that we have the luxury to say, no, we don't want this technology. No, we only see problems. Because the past generations have passed the torch to us and said, look, this is where we headed. And there was a lot of issues and a lot of fuck ups, but there was also progress. And if we enjoy this today in our climate room with our smartphones and go back home on our train, on our TVs, and enjoy the freedom and the prosperity that we have, we better make sure that we perch Part, our part, play our part in this role, and make sure that technology plays a future and beneficial role to our children. So I hope we get this right and see it as a chance. Thank you. All right, excellent. I don't know if the temperature in the room is changing, but that is for another 70 minutes from now. So now you've heard this upbeat agency focused possibility signed. Here is the Debbie Downer team. <laughs> I kid. <laughs> Perhaps a more realistic team, according to all of you. Mauritius, you get to start. And off you go. Yes. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to join. As of today, we are still um, having a situation where uh, the issue that social uh, media amplifies uh, hate and disinformation is not solved yet. We see emerging technologies um, coming up and proposing already new risks uh, to liberal democracies. First, uh, generative AI enables the production of misinformation that may soon uh, be indistinguishable from authentic content. Uh, for example, in their last uh, parliamentary elections in Slovakia, just during the uh, moratorium before the elections, uh, there was a synthetic, uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic uh, audio clip um, of the pro-West uh, candidate being distributed. Um, it was complete, a complete fake, and uh, the candidate was discussing um, allegedly um, election fraud. Um, a big uh, problem, so shortly before the election. Second, we should also consider um, the risks extended uh, reality and also the metaverse post, because they uh, create new immersive worlds um, that also create more extensive data trails of user behavior. And this uh, presents new risks also for the abuse in terms of targeting and tailoring, especially uh, with regards to politics. And then we also have, not but, last but not least, peer-to-peer -peer technology that was promised as a key technology for digital sovereignty, but it will help to build also more um, federated and fragmented also public spheres. So we, um, we will have to see um, how to, you know, like help developers and platforms to get the things right. And don't get me wrong, these technologies hold promises and chances, but we need to address the risks first uh, before we are overloaded with an immersive technological uh, space where, um, yeah, harmful and uh, information and misinformation is flourishing. All right, right on the money. Has he just undercut his argument? I don't know, you decide. Okay, Alexandre, you're next. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to bring you the lens of the geopolitics of technology. Um, technology has always been used to assert hard power and to assert coercion upon others throughout history. 
Um, and when we think about artificial intelligence, quantum, semiconductors, biotechnologies, these are new arenas of fierce competition between great powers, not only the US and China, but also the EU, India, Japan, South Korea, and others. Um, and these technologies also define the future of social relations and the future of the relations in the military realm from the space to the planet Earth, to the very personal relations that we have with each other. Think of drones, which uh, were tested firstly in Afghanistan and now are being used at a very large scale in the uh, war that is occurring in Ukraine. Um, think of what might happen if drones start being used also at scale by non-state actors. These are real risks that we testimony nowadays. Um, Think of the current uh, um, conflict, uh, to say the least, between the US, China, but also Europe when it comes to tariffs and trade wars and export controls. Underneath these elements are technologies and is the fear by even government officials of what might happen in the future when these technologies are widely adopted uh, by also, again, non-state actors. Uh, there is an escalation in rhetoric and in practice. The genius is indeed outside of the bottle, and I don't think that we, policymakers, observers, um, and people with responsibilities, can really follow all technology developments that happen every day, let alone control it and ensure that our societies remain safe. And time. Ooh, perfect. Okay, great. Well done. Okay. Um, and an interesting point. Okay, on we go to Doug. Good evening. What renders the threat posed by generative AI so pernicious is that it hides in plain sight. It's capable of producing enormous quantities of seemingly authentic content that can flood the media and political landscape, at best with drivel, and at worst with outright misinformation. This in turn can hopelessly frustrate government officials' efforts to understand constituent sentiment, undermine voters' capability to hold politicians to account for their actions and decisions, and ultimately erode the social trust on which so many democratic institutions depend. I'd like to briefly just discuss three threats. First, legislators struggle to distinguish between genuine constituent communication and AI-generated advocacy. This is true in 2020 when we conducted a large-scale field experiment involving more than 6,000 U.S. state legislators. It is even more true today with the rapid advances in this technology that can't be foreseen. Second, the threat is perhaps even more pernicious when it comes to regulatory policymaking. In most advanced democracies, the locus of policymaking has shift, increasingly shifted from elected legislatures to the administrative state, creating a democratic deficit. One of the ways in which policymakers have sought to address this is by enacting into law procedures to solicit public input on pending regulations and to require, require government responsiveness to that input. Malicious actors have long sought to exploit this process to skew outcomes. However, past astroturfing efforts, as it's been called, were foiled in large part because so many comments were identical. Generative AI can easily overcome this, uh, this limitation, seriously undermining agencies' efforts to understand and respond to the preferences of interested stakeholders. Finally, social media simply gives a mechanism for it to spread like wildfire. The solutions are complex and uncertain, the threats are protean, but it is essential that we accelerate our efforts and make them commensurate to the scale of the threat. Excellent. Thank you, Doug. Right on time. Molly, you're, the floor is yours. When it comes to emerging technologies, whether the increased use of AI in almost every work environment, uh, diving into the metaverse, or maybe even moving towards a cashless society, maybe not here in Germany, um, there is still a broad unknown on how our democratic societies will be impacted, but we're starting to get a sense. For me, one of the things that I think of when I consider the impact of emerging tech on democracies is, of course, the 2016 election in the US and everything that we have learned since. First, we learned that the American election infrastructure is vulnerable to cyber attacks. We saw further ev evidence of this following the following year at DEF CON, which is the world's largest hacking conference, where, which I attended in 2017, in two key ways. The first is that it was shown that it would be technically feasible to physically hack American election digital infrastructure. The second is that 
It proved that we can't just be concerned about the actual election voting machines being hacked, but also uh, that we have to protect the entire infrastructure behind elections, including but not limited to how results are transmitted and reported publicly. Then, and perhaps uh, even most, more relevant today, is that we learned that there was proven Russian interference via social media uh, and misinformation campaigns during that election. Since then, the threat of mis- and disinformation has only continued to grow, with the Global Risks Report 2024 naming it as a top risk because exactly, as my colleague said, of its ability to question the legitimacy um, and trust that we have in our democracies. My biggest concern is that we do not have an adequate media literacy nor a strong whole of society approach to effectively combat the threat of purposeful mis- and disinformation. In the United States, only 18 states as of November 2023 required media literacy and education in schools. If a free and fair democracy is a cornerstone of, de of democracy, how can we be sure, sorry, if free and fair elections are the cornerstone of democracy, how can we be sure that our security, our society is actually secure? And time. Great. <laughs> how impressive was that? Right? For two teams who did not know each other before they got together in a big huddle last Friday. Okay, so now, by the way, there are ground rules for every part of this evening. This next phase is a question phase, which is to say team one gets to ask a question of team two, team two gets to ask a question of team one. There is a four minute response segment. You can all decide how you respond. You can pre-huddle depending on what the question is, whether you wanna take it one by one, everybody gets a minute, or you wanna do two and two, or somebody does all four, your call, okay? So you now, no wait, you get to ask a question of team one because they went first and their opinions have settled. So uh, one question, four minutes to respond. Whoever's asking the question, All right. go now. So team one, rising income inequality and the policy failures to help those left behind by globalization and the information economy are widely believed to be the factors fueling today's rising tide of authoritarianism and populism. Doesn't AI risk exacerbating these trends, further straining already vulnerable democratic institutions? Four minutes to respond. This part. Uh, Okay, I go first. Um, well, I mean, it's again, it's a, it depends on how you apply it. Of course, you can use it as a, um, um, as a mean to defer as people, but at the same time, I mean, you can also use it um, as a mean to, uh, to integrate people into democracy. For example, there are great um, examples. If you look at um, Estland, for example, if you digitalize elections, for example, that um, the participation rate might increase, or for example, what we're working on at Correct. Um, we try to integrate citizens into journalism, into our research, and this is actually possible through civic tech, including AI-based technologies. So again, it depends on how you apply it, um, and also to whom do you actually want to leave these technologies. So. Uh, I would just argue we have two choices. Either we go the way of freedom and enabling people to give them more choices and ensuring that AI helps us, democracies, to be more efficient, or uh, the Chinese global world will actually secure this way because ultimately autocracies are always more efficient because they don't have to care anything about uh, representation or uh, uh, voice diversity. So I would argue that AI actually can help us in this way, and not just AI, we're talking about other technologies as well, to ensure that a Western liberal model of democracies, which, by the way, a report came out this week, is not just under threat, but retreating. Uh, uh, so our model of, uh, how to say, selling democracies abroad and ensuring that people still consider it as a viable and best option for ensuring uh, equality, ensuring safety, ensuring freedom and liberty. Uh, so democracy needs to be enhanced by those technologies in order to make sure it is still considered uh, viable and actually the better choice for living uh, people's and society's life. Well, basically, the government is having troubles to fulfill its contract with the people, provide services that they really need. So who better to do it if we don't have the right people to do it? We don't have the people really going to the public sector. We want to go, I want to work for the state. So who can we help? Who can we ask? Uh, technology solution. 
is actually the only solution that we have to fulfill the contract that was is actually built between the people and the state. Anna? We still have time, um, right? Yeah. You have time. Uh, you have uh, another minute and a half. <laughs> yeah, I would, um, I would just add, uh, well, I'm not sure what exactly, what kind of research or who <laughs> actually believes um, that actually information technologies helped with inequalities, especially with inequalities. Maybe it's now somehow interfering with democra democracy, but I'm a I'm firm believer that we are going to find solutions to that if we, again, like have rather positive attitude to, temp uh, to technology and encourage innovation um, in finding solutions rather than um, basing our decisions on fears. But in terms of inequalities, I think that digital technologies, information technologies has provided unprecedented access to people who did not have any access before, unprecedented access to doing business, even, even myself. I mean, during pandemic times, I was sitting in my home country and I was making business all over the world. And I did not need to be in the US in like the Silicon Valley or somewhere. I mean, it provides a huge um, opportunities and you cannot dismiss that. It provides huge opportunities in Asia, in Africa, and maybe the major reason why, um, why we have an increasing inequality is the result of uh, economic policies and not the information technologies. Okay, they landed that boat with seven seconds to spare. Thank you. Now, here comes your, their question for you. No, um, all right, I'm going to give it a shot. Um, you mentioned beforehand what happens if the technology comes to, you know, gets to the people or it gets into the hand of um, not the good guys. Uh, unmanned systems, not the first time we see it in Ukraine, 2014, actually onwards in, in Iraq and uh, Syria. The Islamic State used it against coalition forces. Uh, we weren't the first to use them in the, the small ones exceptionally. And today, what do you see? In Ukraine, it's the lifeline for an entire nation defending against a superior threat. So which is it? You want it? Or you don't? Okay, team two. Off you go. <laughs> we all like the positives, of course. So it's obviously a good thing that if we defend Ukraine and if we believe that Ukraine should win, win this war, then uh, Ukraine should have access to the best possible technology. That's clear. Um, the point is we don't always or only get the positives and when um when we think about drones and how they can be used by non-state actors we can also think of uh, um, situations outside of open war conflicts where we will not like the outputs and that's also why we have a responsibility to try to regulate or at least slow down a little bit the pace of technology development and not just let it run freely that's the fundamental problem we let it run freely before with artificial intelligence and we had well elections uh, uh, being impacted all over the world that keeps happening that happened just uh, in my home country portugal for the first time we had external interference in our elections that just happened last week. So I want the good guys to win all the time, but my good guys are not the same good guys as someone else's. And that's the fundamental problem. That's why we need to find the right guardrails and to adjust our export control regimes, for instance, to make sure that uh, technologies are used in, with at least certain rules so that we don't uh, complain every now and then, as we do every day, basically, about the negative impacts. So that would be my immediate reaction. I would just say quickly that the scale of the challenges are just immense and that they're multifaceted. So there are security aspects, there are questions about election security, there's questions about national security and the implications. And on the economic front, I have no doubt that information technology has lifted an immense number of people out of poverty in different places. However, with any sort of economic disruption, there are going to be losers. Uh, and so we have to have an economic policy response for what's going to happen to those who lose from this massive economic disruption that's going to happen in the next five to 20 years. Uh, and if we don't, we should be very prepared for there to be serious consequences, political and otherwise, within democratic societies. I'll go ahead and just add my two cents to this, and which is, um, you know, first I find it interesting that the question was on the weapon systems and not on, uh, you know, 
the fact that most of us talked about the threat of misinformation. Um, because obviously, when it comes to emerging technology, there's, as uh, Doug just said, there's so many different facets to this. Um, and I think talking about weapon systems is an entirely different level that we have to consider maybe outside of the realm of this exact discussion, at least for my per personal preferences. Um, that being said, I mean, I think there's rules of the road when it comes to using technology and newer forms of technology when it comes when, in weapons, especially, you know, just to compare it for lack of a better capability to nuclear weapons. Um, you know, we don't want the bad guys to have those either. Uh, and we do everything that we can to stop that. So I think in that regard, there is no reason why we can't do that in this instance as well. Yes, I, I think authoritarian uh, states um, depend, like based on like what we have um, at the ISD found out uh, in the last two years since their beginning of the invasion of Ukraine, the full-scale invasion, they have been very creative in making use of these um, modern technologies. They have uh, tactics and techniques that always um, adapt to the current state of the regulation. They make use of modern technologies. We've just recently also identified um, more than 60 uh, JetGPT um, coordinated inauthentic accounts on X that spread uh, harmful messages about Navalny. Um, so we see here early use cases already. Uh, one of the largest uh, influence operations was actually about... Um, Last minute inauthentic news sites, and just imagine the opportunities of JetGPT uh, to create such sites. And time. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. Faster than the bell. OK, this is your time to get involved in the debate. We have 14 minutes for you to s ask probing questions. That seems like a lot, and it seems like we're going to go multiple rounds, but we're not. I need one probing question from one of you to go to team one, and then they will have five minutes to answer that question, and one probing question to go to team two, the con side, and they also will have five minutes to answer that question. And then we're going to, and this is to get your juices flowing, one meta question to give to both teams that they can rebut themselves on and argue across the table. <laughs> Clear? Yes, I'm telling you, you have to do just as much work as they do. Okay, so who has a probing question for Team Pro? Remember, we're all trying to get deeper into the discussion, maybe change each other's minds, so let it not be an easy question. <laughs> oh, see how they're working? Yeah. <laughs> well, clearly they've already made up their minds. It's got to come from you. It can't come from me. I mean, I have a lot of questions, but we might be here all evening. They're all pro. Can't they switch to bright side? They've already switched to the pro side. You're speaking to a convinced audience. Uh, well, ooh, now, now suddenly, see, it always there's always that little warm-up moment, even in an Oxford-style debate. Okay, so we're going to go all the way out here, actually, because that hand shot up ever so slightly before yours did, sir. Thank you. How do you want to deal with autonomous weapon systems like killer robots? Great. A real easy one for the pro side. Okay. And autonomous weapons, killer robots, five minutes. Go. Well, well I have more to do with chatbots. Does that count? No. 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 You mean like proper weapon systems, right? Well, I would say we talked about, it was mentioned by the team earlier. I think... Uh, the question of technology is never a question of technology. It's never good or bad. You can use a knife to make a wonderful dinner for your wife, or you can kill someone. Yeah? And the same question is when it comes to weapons and the question who uses them. Is it the police protecting a uh, citizen you know, from a harmful burglar? Is it, as we talked about, Ukraine? a democracy defending itself against a slaughtering regime that is killing innocent civilians. So I think when we talk about robots and the question of ethics, that's a different ballgame. I think it was mentioned it's quite tricky to answer that in a matter of just a couple of minutes. But when we come to the question of how technology is used in order to do good, and when it comes to military questions, it's, of course, a highly risky one where I would never doubt that there are a lot of risks and a lot of ethical concerns, especially when it comes to the question of human agent and who at the end decides when it comes to lethal usage. 
But it was mentioned earlier, actually, by the other side, if we want to ensure that freedom and democracy prevails in the 21st century, we cannot use arrows and bows while the other side uh, is going to go into space or is going to uh, use sci-fi weapons against us. So I would argue in that case that with your question in mind, we need to make sure that f free Western liberal democracies are equally equipped as the bad guys who are not going to take a day off and who actually do everything as we can already see and as it was mentioned by the other side with disinformation, with a lot of bad tactics to disintegrate and to completely destroy our democratic societies from the inside. So we got to make sure we are equipped and we are ready and you're going to kind of come here because we can scare you off. Uh, autonomous systems are not always bad. Uh, obviously, you have to put this in perspective. Um, air defense system, there's no one really pushing a button anymore. So if something, a, a missile approaches a ship, no one in the loop shoots automatically. No time to actually react on this aspect. So in, in this respect, there are a lot of autonomous weapons or systems already out there. Um, but we're pretty clear on this standpoint. NATO is pretty clear. The Western society is pretty clear. It's the concept of human in the loop, human on the loop as well. So there's a clear doctrine by Western governments to not go for autonomous weapon systems, where the human oversight is not guaranteed anymore. And basically, we have sending something off, and it will do something, and we don't know really what it's going to be doing. Uh, we have a clear perspective on this issue. The other ones, as Yuri said, they don't. They don't really care about this. They don't really care if the rate of signal comes from an enemy position or their own, really. Uh, this is the disregard for who is really the human being on the other side, because this has to be taken into consideration, whereas we, uh, I believe, as a Western society, take, take care of and take pride in taking care of the people, even soldiers that we send into war eventually. The other side might not be. So we could obviously, yes, regulate it. Uh, we could have ITAR go even stricter regul regulations. Uh, we could have um, more cookie banners uh, because we want to secure a GDPR compliance. Uh, where's the value creation of this? Where it's really not just economic value creation, but the value creation for society and all of this. Um, so yes, it's, it's something that has to be taken serious. Luckily, uh, the Western Hemisphere has taken a clear stance on this. And um, well, where do we want to stand at the end of, our, of all of this? Okay, minute tw 20 to go. A minute 10 for your side. Uh, I maybe I can add. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, first thing, I don't want to sabotage my team members, but <laughs> <laughs> I have to slightly disagree on something um, about the example of knife, which I usually always disagree. So also I have to disagree with it now. Um, well, I would not say, uh, even though I'm in a pro side, I'm very on a positive side of um, use of AI technologies. Usually, um, I don't necessarily see it in all cases as neutral technology. I mean, knife is not as powerful as autonomous um, weapon system can be. I mean, knife has probably just one use case. You can uh, stab someone and kill with it, but uh, the autonomous weapon systems can actually, is much more powerful. It can basically too easily say kill more people at, and maybe it can become unpredictable because it's AI and sometimes it's un unpredictable. So as uh, Lawrence already said, um, Western society has already has its stance on it. And I think definitely there are and there will be some technologies to actually be really concerned and to either prohibit its use or either be really careful and really highly regulated. And Just time. Take, yeah. See, this is where the gray zones begin <laughs> to happen, which is why your questions are so important. So one question for team two, and I know you've been busy getting that ready. Look at that hand just shot up right there. Practice makes perfect. Uh, if I understand you correctly, you want to in a way, stop the race. Uh, of technology, right? So if we take the adversaries and the bad guys, um, they will keep developing it. Um, I'm interested in, don't you see the, uh, the opportunity in developing, keeping up the race and also defending our democracies by external influence? And so the question is, why do you want to stop the race, um, improving the technology based on the code of ethics um, of democracies to stop the interference of, uh, in a way, the bad guys. Five minutes and go. Yeah, I may, I may start. Um, I don't think the point is whether we want to stop the development of uh, technologies. Uh, again, the genius is outside of the bottle. That's the idea that I like. And we don't really have an alternative 
um, because otherwise we'll not be able to defend ourselves. That's clear. Uh, the question is, and going back to the original question that triggered this debate and our position, uh, is, um, is technology going to be harmful or not to our societies? And our position would be, yes, it will be, regardless of how we keep defending ourselves, because we need to do that. In any case, what we see with development of technologies is that there's an impact in society. Societies are disintegrating themselves. We, he, we know that there, is, there are these bubbles in, in the in, in online, right? So everyone can only see their own point of view. Um, there's less communication, and also there's the divide between, and that's something that was not sufficiently addressed, I believe, in this debate. There is a, di a divide between people who do have access to all these technologies and those who don't. And the communication channels between the two groups are less and less prevalent in our societies nowadays. And that's the problem. It's uh, the realization of the challenge that uh, we are putting forward here tonight, I think. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I, th I, I would echo everything that Alexander said. Um, I don't think anyone is saying that we're going to put the genie back in the bottle or that we're going to totally stop. But uh, f look, compare this to the situation we find ourselves in with social media. For so long, there was no real regulation of it at all. There was, it was sort of left to uh, the corporate titans that, that developed these tools. Uh, and it was the Wild West. And now we have all of this data that suggests how harmful it is to all of us, but particularly to children uh, and to young people. And it's so much harder to regulate end use products post ex facto than to be proactive with it. And we should recognize just the scale of the threats that we face. Uh, earlier today, it was mentioned uh, transparency and the, the need for transparency. And we, de we debated what the, the meaning of the word is. But what are the training sets that are being used, even in some of the more benign technologies that have nothing to do with autonomous weapon systems? Uh, how are biases that sort of, you know, in the nature of the data that's being scraped, that's being fed into the algorithm, going to reproduce themselves? And with what consequences? And so I think what Team 2 is arguing is not that we're going to shut off the world uh, and that autocracies will have these wonderful toys and democracies will have nothing. Nothing, but that it takes responsible use by all of us to not delegate the decisions over how this technology is going to be developed and how it's going to be used to a handful uh, of very, a very small elite of corporate actors. And instead, it's for whom uh, and under whose auspices. Uh, and that we all need to be involved and we need to go into it very wide-eyed uh, to the risks. Two minutes. To summarize a little bit what Doug said, I think, what we're looking for instead of um, you know, stopping the race is finding the right rules of the road that we can all agree to. Um, you know, and for instance, here in Europe, obviously just last week, the EU AI Act um, uh, was approved by the EU Parliament. And I think that's like a really great first step moving forward, as we saw back in, what was it, 2015 with the GDPR. Um, you need these first steps to continue to be able to move forward in a way where we are being conscious of our ethics, where we are being conscious of the impact on our democratic societies, and we, where we are taking the data that is now available to us and trying to improve on the technologies that we have in a way that ensures that our societies continue to benefit. Yeah, thanks for the question. In 2024, it's 4.2 billion uh, people who will go to the polls, and Gen AI offers huge opportunities for political campaigning. And in their terms of use, they say this is not allowed, but in the reality, we see like actually the tools are used, for example, in Indonesia to create like a, a chatbot to create targeting. So, how can we hold the companies accountable if not by, you know, like um, regulation that applies with our fundamental rights, but that um, I think you also mentioned it, that uh, it foresees code of conduct, that foresees better safety by design. Um, it's not stopping the race, but it's finding an approach that, um, yeah, that goes along also with our democratic values and with our fundamental rights. Excellent. With 20 seconds to spare. Okay, now, this is the tricky part of the audience participation bit because now you have to have come up with a question that's 30,000 foot enough that provokes both of these teams into rebuttal type answers, right? This is a wholly participatory exercise. <laughs> so, with that in mind, we have two more audience questions. And I'd love to get a woman in this conversation. Ooh, now we've set the bar too high. But these people are all prepared. You're, you know, just as on the spot. There you go.
If you're watching at home, we're having a moment in technology here. Hello, hello. No. Aha. <laughs> The risks of relying on technology. Um, so I'm going to give this a shot and try and find something that applies to you both. Sure, it's going to be great. I think the, um, the main problem that we're encountering here is the lack of understanding. So humanity has had a um, long track record of implementing things and commercializing them before understanding the risks in depth. Um, and I think um, on both sides it applies that for the people who are pro-technology and freedom around it, um, there's a lack of willingness to uh, try and understand and that's the risks that might arise because also that um, might undermine the development of technology. But on the policy side, a lot of the time I see technology and cyber policies being made by people who have the policy um, and the, the geopolitics aspect quite well understood, but not so much the technological aspect understood. Um, so when the policies are drafted by people who don't understand technology, um, then that comes into conflict with the ones who do push the development of technology. So how do we resolve this conflict in order to find a balance between the two sides that you are representing? Oh, that is a great question. I love that for both teams. Okay, fantastic. Each of you has four minutes to respond to this question based on your perspectives in team, and then you can rebut each other for another six more minutes. Yes? Should we start over there? Everybody's looking at me unhappy. Okay, all right, fine. We're starting with team two this time. Four minutes for, from the con side, four minutes from the pro side, and then they get to go head to head one more time. And then of course it's your chance to, for the final vote. Okay, over here, team two, over to you. I'll kick us off. Um, my favorite answer to this question is education. Um, and this really rests in uh, kind of what I was starting to get at in my opening statement, which is media literacy. And generally speaking, more training and um, in general understanding of what the media landscape is, how to think critically about it in a way that is nonpartisan, coming from a very American perspective. Um, you know, the fact that Americans don't even agree on whether or not media literacy is a non, like learning about media literacy is non-biased is schwierig, as the Germans say. <laughs> um, it's just, it's, it's, it's really disheartening. And I think a lot of this um, can be solved through further education and um, focusing on making sure that everyone actually understands what tools are available to them and um, moving forward on that point. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll chime in. Um, yeah, on, on the one hand, of course, we need um, regulators and policymakers to have a an understanding of technologies. For example, how will, um, how will criminal codes be enforced in the metaverse, for example? How to document actually content on, then on the other side, on the hand of the uh, platforms. But of course, regulators uh, will have to, to get better in understanding the technologies. However, at the same time, um, companies, specifically developers, coders, will also have to have an understanding, you know, like of uh, democratic risks posed by technologies. And they can look at like how were technologies exploited in the past and try to apply this um, knowledge to the current projects. And here we have to become much better. We have to get civil society um, providing these trainings. We, have, uh, we need to have like, good models to provide civil society in turn with funding to provide such trainings. And yeah, it ties in with the argument for education. Yeah, maybe just to yeah, uh, strengthen that idea, I think uh, there is clearly a gap um, in government circles, in policymakers, in the knowledge they have on the technicalities of what they are regulating. I think that is accurate. Uh, but at the, there is also a lack of understanding, indeed, of you know people working on the technologies of the impact they may have. Uh, if you talk with a startup, they will be very excited about the product they are developing. They are looking at the you know the output, the impact uh, that they may have in a specific niche, and the, we need to bring these people together so that the negative effects that technologies may have are at least. Uh, um, yeah, oh, I are addressed in, in, a, in a certain way. Um, so we need more ethics uh, um, and more, a more ethical way of developing technologies. And we also need to educate uh, uh, policymakers. That's missing. And um, yeah, we need to, you know, as with everything in life, we need to, to discuss and sit together and find solutions. Yeah. One last minute for your answer on substance to the question, team two. 
Sure, at the risk of uh, giving uh, Team One uh, ammunition, I think there, there's certainly truth to the, the more regulation that we try to do, especially given the informational asymmetries, it's going to lead to inefficiencies and there are going to be costs to that. Um, however, uh, the risks here are really substantial uh, and some are known and they're clear. Uh, there's misinformation, micro-targeted misinformation, uh, nihilism of people just not believing anything because they don't know what to believe or not to believe, and so they drop out of the political process. And then, I can't believe I'm going to do this, but I'm going to quote Don Rumsfeld, our <laughs> illustrious former Secretary of Defense. They're the known unknowns, and you have Turing Award winners that are talking about you know, the, the threat to autonomous AI uh, algorithms that are no longer uh, responsive to human control. Given the scope of the threat, I think that we have to err on the side of taking this very seriously and cautiously, uh, even though there are clear costs to doing so. Okay, 350, yep, four minutes, perfectly on the dot. Okay, your question, or your responses, I'm sorry, to this question. Well, I mean, there's nothing you can say against education. There's also regulation that is respecting the freedoms and liberal democracies. Nothing against that either. But I think you're working on paper here. Because the reality is actually, I mean, we can now lean back and discuss regulation for maybe, let's say, five years. And then it takes another, if you're thinking of an EU level, like another few years until it's finally implemented on a national level. Unfortunately, technology will continue developing. And also, technology will be applied in, in the time. So I think these um, in different aspects have to happen in parallel. And the other thing is also when we talk about media and information literacy education, we do that a lot at Corrective, and uh, there's a lot happening also to counter disinformation. It's a very fragmented field, but the challenge there is how do we actually reach the target groups that are particularly vulnerable? when it comes, for example, to disinformation. And there, actually, if you're looking at innovative ways um, to, um, well, to spread the word and to educate people, why not use, for example, AI te and technologies to, to do so? So there's so many, I could name so many great projects who, who, who are doing this. And um, just leaning back now, first educate everyone and keep them away from the technologies and first regulate and not apply the technologies. I think we will definitely lose the, um, the race. Absolutely, and I think if regulation is your primary answer, then you're already lost. Regulation is an utter battle cry for people that don't really foresee and predict what's happening. Why? Because as the team mentioned, we can only regulate what we can understand. The problem is, and believe me, I work with a lot of politicians, a lot of them don't understand what they're voting on. Actually, the vast majority, you get your papers in the morning, you say you're going to vote yes on this, you're going to vote no on that. Do you actually think those people who make the regulation for us know what they're voting on? No. Uh, and that's a sad fact, and I actually think to even go further, if we want to save democracy, and as it was mentioned, and I couldn't agree more with the threats that you highlighted, being from disinformation and others, we need to reinvent the system. The operating model is the problem. Uh, bureaucracy is the problem, because our processes take way too long. And if I think about a friend of mine uh, who came from Ukraine, who uh, is a doctor, and who it took him six months to get a license because the, uh, the, the administration was not able to translate his document in time, when AI could do this in a matter of a day, and he could actually start working, saving lives the next day, he would be willing to do so, but he's not able to do so. And I think when we talk about all this matter, what we need to understand, we need to go beyond our typical toolbox of thinking. And when we just say, oh, we got to regulate this, we got to educate here. That sounds nice, but it's not going to change the issues of the problems of tomorrow. We got to anticipate how technology is going to change our educational system and what we can do about it and then predict what are good resources in order to regulate. Yes, but we first got to see the opportunity and the chance and the innovation. When we talk first about regulation and shut everything down, we're going to lose. Um, before I get to the policy side, when it comes to technology, there's one thing we could all do. It's called open source technology. The more we know about the technology and the more people know about the technology and know what has been coded somewhere, the better we'll be able to detect threats, work with them, and implement them in better and non-harmful ways. Um, but on the policy side, it's, is it really technology? Or is it if, if someone spreads misinformation, is technology to blame that it works? Or is it the narrative of a state, a government, or politics 
that is not strong enough to people to convince people that, well, this is stupid. This is a narrative that I don't agree with. Uh, you see that in Scandinavian countries. Uh, if a narrative is spread about how good Russia is, they are pretty exactly knowing where this is coming from. They have a strong narrative. They have a strong position. They have a common view on what is good and what is bad. So basically, policies should direct into this direction. which have nothing to do with technology, but do people trust in what we say? All right, that caps it. Nope, you're out of time. OK. <laughs> That's but now is the time when you can debate one another, because this is the open rebuttal phase, my favorite <laughs> time. Uh, six minutes each side, because you went last with your arguments, you now get to aggrieve them, and they get to aggrieve you for six minutes. And go. Maybe I'll, I'll just start. Um, yeah, you um, already tried to capture um, current regulative initiatives as, you know, like, breaks to, to progress. Um, let me clarify that um, frameworks like the AI Act or the DSA uh, or the DMA, they are like very innovative open. They are open to technologies. This is like why some people, um, even who would argue on ours, I'd say they are not specific enough because they are already so vague so that they are technology friendly. And they already have exceptions for particularly small uh, and medium-sized companies, um, including startups. Um, at the same time, um, we also, of course, from the regulator side, have to support companies in being compliant. Imagine an instance owner um, suddenly having to fulfill specific content and moderation notice and takedown mechanisms. Um, if they don't do it, if they don't have the pl plugins, for example, yeah, we will see a lot of um, um, problematic content flourishing on these technological innovations. I'll just go ahead and jump in quickly. Um, I think on one point that Lawrence or, or Yuri said, you know, misinformation actually is not a new concept, right? Um, we used to call it propaganda. <laughs> uh, and it just is really the technology that has changed how we receive it and how prevalent it has gotten. And, you know, both between misinformation and disinformation, of which there is a very clear difference, um, which I'm not going to get into the technical definitions and purpose of time, but my point being, our strategies have to evolve um, and we have to deal with what makes us different from how it was before. And so in that, in, in, in that point of view, this is where we need the shared rules of the road, the regulation, the at least, if it's not regulation, at least norms, um, and understanding of how we want to move forward to defend our democracies from some of these threats that are being adversely affected because of the role that technology is playing. Yeah, maybe just to, to add on something that was said earlier, uh, that our democratic model is retreating and that technology is the only solution. I don't really think that's true, per se, because technology was also what led our democratic models to retreat in the first place. So we need new norms, indeed, to make sure that uh, um, technology, at least in our societies, is used in a way that is... Uh, uh, in line with uh, with our values, um, and the technology should not be blamed because it works, but that's that 's removing the human agency of the discussion. Technology works because engineers make it work uh, uh, that 's not really the point. The point is what do we want to do with this technology, and to what extent do we want to protect our societies? Um, from what this technology can be can, can, can do if it is misused, and that's where we, we humans and at the politician and, and the policy making level and the politicians level needs to 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 be addressed. We need to have a, a more a knowledge and information being shared between civil society uh, um, and the policy making circles to make sure that our uh, uh, um, our focus is clear and to make sure that we just uh, um, that, that, that we, we use technology in a proper way. Um, technology itself is nothing without what we make uh, out of it. You have one minute. Two. Sure. And change. 
Okay, uh, quickly, I, I, <laughs> I like the line, if, if regulation is the answer, you've already lost. And uh, there's got to be some truth to that. However, I'm sort of reminded of the, of the Churchill quote, you know, it's the, it's the worst damn response except for all the others. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I would ask, what is, the, what is the response otherwise, you know, if it's not government involvement in some ways? So some of it might be regulating the technology and the way in which it's employed or uh, mandating open source or, you know, various things that are, that are beyond uh, uh, aspects that I study. But I think the other aspect of the policy response that does require recognizing the, the different nature of the threat posed is just that there's going to be fallout. There are going to be winners. There are going to be losers. There are going to be inequalities. So there are some things where regulation might do a good job at, which is sort of finding uh, you know, sources of bias when you get biased results, when they're reinforcing existing biases in, in society. Are there ways in which we can uh, regulate against that? Because after all, these would be uh, having AI perform roles that previously were not done by AI, and they're against existing laws. So it's just sort of finding ways uh, to ensure compliance with this new technological world that we, that we will be living in over the next five to ten years you know, with our existing uh, values and, and in many cases with our existing laws, but also really taking uh, seriously sort of what are going to be the results of, of the implementation of this technology uh, across the economy uh, and having a, a policy response to it. And that it's in large part uh, uh, failures, uh, uh, policy failures in the past to other major economic disruptions that have caused a lot of the problems, uh, political problems that we have and the, the uh, challenges that the democracy faces. And that if politicians are not attuned to that or we as democratic citizens aren't attuned to that and encouraging our elected officials to think about about how we're going to mitigate the, the, the potential uh, negative effects for millions of people, uh, even as many others are, are advantaged, that, that we will have lost a great opportunity and caused a lot of problems for democracy. And time. Six minutes to rebut. OK, I start. Um, yeah. I do agree on all of your points. Basically, AI is unprecedented technology with its benefit. And it is also unprecedented technology with the risks. It is really high risks. Like, for example, even ChatGPT could be able one day to teach someone how to make a chemical weapon just right in their garage, just buy some, some of the materials in the pharmacy and make a weapon. Um, it's really high risks, but between right and wrong, there is a field. And in this field, we innovate AI as much as possible, but we also innovate on governance as much, as much as possible. And when I say governance, I don't necessarily mean regulation because I don't believe regulation is a good solution in a way that regulation is static, while AI is adaptive and AI is moving very, very fast forward. Even with the EUAA Act, we saw that how much longer it took when ChatGPT has been launched. It stretched the entire process for one more year at least. So we need to innovate something at also, also a technological solution probably for the governance. And this is also what I'm trying to do, what our startup has trying to do. Like uh, when I say end-to-end -end solution for AI governance, I usually mean not only software solution for AI governance, but also social innovation solution for AI governance. And this has been my biggest work um, recently in the last two years. Before the software, the most important part for me personally is to innovate on social innovation, to create some different kind of approaches to AI governance that is able to address different contexts of AI applications because AI is highly context dependent and it is not static, it is adaptive and moving. So we have to also move with our governance solutions as well. Um, Got a wrong window. Um, yes, you're right. Um, actually, I'm, I'm surprised that you mentioned that perspective that technology should be made in our views and our, should in, inherently have our perspectives. Uh, I agree. Uh, the other ones don't. But the other ones are investing 150 billion plus, that other country being China. Um, basically, outnumbering in, in every facet possible, just putting more weight into this game. Um, and our answer is regulation. Regulation, which is not flexible, um, up to, well, basically, I'd say last year, December, what was really cool was was called scaling law. So basically, the bigger a language model gets, the more it can do. And that's when we put regulation in place. Well, since then, we go the opposite way. It gets smaller, very smaller. Every week, it gets smaller and more, more uh, performant, actually. So we have regulation, which doesn't take this into account, and here we are. Uh, 
what now? How, how do we go around with this? And isn't it basically, because you, you mentioned Donald Rumsfeld, in another context he said, if there's a 1% chance, <laughs> um, there is a 1% chance. Um, the other ones are not going to shy away from it. Uh, the other ones are not going to go, oh, they have regulations. Oh, they're developing something. But where are we in this race? And I, I, I really admire the question that was raised in, from the audience. It was like, all right, and I believe we're not one to all uh, stop with this race. But we can't. It's simply that we can't. The outcome, you say, would be questionable, unfortunate, potentially positive. I don't see it. Uh, if we don't command where this technology is heading, we have to set the rules. And whoever owns this technology gets to make the rules. It's something that social media has taught us over the last years. If you own the technology and you champion it and you're the sovereign of this technology, you set the rules. So we should, yes, we should win this race. And I don't see why we should not. I'm just going to weigh in a very simple question. Do we believe democracy is in a good state right now or we don't? And that's actually to, to the two-thirds in the audience who said that we predominantly see risks. Because our societies are eaten from inside out from populism. People are not happy with what's going on in the capitals. People are not happy with the results governments are producing. People are not happy with the regulators trying to figure out what all these complex problems should produce. So I would argue what you just highlighted is a lot of nice talking. But the question is, are we able to deliver results to the people? Because if we don't, we will see very quickly, easily, slowly, one democracy dying after another, fa falling to the lurch and the promising tales of populists. We might see it in the US again this year. We might see it at the European elections. We might see it even here in Germany at the state elections this fall. So my question is, can technology, and this is the question at heart, help us? solving those problems that our democracies are inherently flawed and inherently incapable of solving? Or do we believe it's too dangerous, we got to stick away? That's the question I think we all have to ask ourselves. 40 seconds, Carolina. Yeah. This has been like a very strong word at the end, I think. But um, to me, the answer is obviously quite clear. And one thing is, um, also, we've been talking a lot now on regulation. And I don't think that we want to be the anti-regulation team or anything. It's only that, and we have a lot of positive examples from journalism, actually, where we believe in co-regulation. So there has to be a framework, actually, that sets certain rules. Um, but also, then also needs to be self-regulation from the sector itself um, to actually make sure that, um, uh, that to safeguard democracy. And I think we can also apply the same ideas, actually, when we think about, for example, um, AI regulation. And then the other thing is, maybe we have been talking a lot about what we can do, for example, against this and misinformation, but we can also tackle the whole um, topic from another perspective, and this also concerns policymakers. What, when we, what can we do for good information, for facts, and for democracy? And time. Fantastic. I'm really impressed at the level of debate that we've had and the speed at which we've had it. I think also the comprehensibility of which we've had it, because I have had no problems following. But what I have learned is that in both sides, there's a fair amount of overlap and potential gray space and gray matter, which makes your task none the easier right now. Because your task now, having listened to both sides, including this rather spirited rebuttal, is to revote the question. And so I ask you again at home, here in the room, to reopen your Slido app, to reach for the device that now harbors your innermost secrets, <laughs> and uh, vote again. And I will give you the questions again, because maybe now, despite all of these clarifying comments, you might be a little confused. Team one, the pro team was arguing, has been arguing for the past 70 minutes that new technologies, AI, quantum computing, we didn't get to biotech, we didn't get to synthetic computing, we didn't get to those issues, but that's for another debate, have great potential and will enhance open, just, and democratic societies. Team one, the pro team. I'll remind you that they lost in our first poll. Team two, new technologies, pose a risk to open just democratic societies and could easily 
undermine them. You've heard a couple of ideas on regulation, on education. You've heard other ideas on forecasting, get ahead of, getting ahead of the wave, moving away from politicians making decisions, framing that debate. So you now have another about three minutes and 20 seconds to make your voice heard in this vote. We'll put the vote up again. I've just been told that we'll first see the slides, but then ultimately Slide. we'll see some percentage points. So yeah. is it already, well, is it still, it's, yeah. it might still be running because people still have two minutes. So we'll give everybody two minutes, but I will remind you that this conversation was nothing if not full of rich quotes, and I will give some of them back to you because uh, I will certainly use them. If regulation is your primary tool, then you've already lost. Uh, and on the other side, uh, we had the, the critical point that if, of course, you do not educate your legislators to make the kind of decisions and change the entire gambit of learning within a society to get ahead of these problems, you will lock yourself out of the kind of ne necessary decision making we need moving forward. And with 20 seconds on the clock, that, oh, I have a feeling it's still moving. It is beginning to, we're beginning to close on out. <clears throat> How narrow, uh, see, we're going to need the percentage points, Aspen colleagues, because uh, this is within a hair's range of voting. Okay, and with that, I have nine seconds to go on our vote. Somebody correct me on time, but that's what I've got. Yes? Okay, I know. It's the anticipation in this room is just palpable. I can, I, ah! Okay, so it's, uh, according to me, one person voted, and now uh, here, at least, it's neck and neck. But we're going to need those percentage points. OK. And scene. OK. Can we so also vote? If you're seeing what I'm seeing. We need a second for the percentages. Yes, I know. That's why I'm filibustering over here. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're seeing what I've seen, this team did a pretty good job, yes? Because. Those sliders have slid. Thanks, Slido. Uh, those sliders have slid. And they have slid so much that we have, quote unquote, met at least sort of in the middle. Because as I think you're taking away from this first day of this incredibly timely and relevant conversation, because as the ambassador said this morning, we're of course heading straight into a spring, last spring debate. Uh, in the EU-US Trade and Technology Council, after which its entire nature might be transformed. We might be having these conversations again on a bigger scale through the G7, but that these conversations and the way that we think public policy for the 21st century, the way that we think our democracies for the 21st century will be vital in terms of how we govern, the way that we defend ourselves, the way we educate ourselves, and most importantly, the way we prepare the route and road for the next generation. So with that, let's, can we see how close our percentage points actually are? Beginning and end. Okay, Sweet. let me get out of the way. Okay, so the very risk adverse group, remember you were all con in this room, or 65% of you were, 35% of you, these people had to win back 20 some, per, almost 20 percentage points, and they did. Look at that. All right, so 14 points plus, percentage points plus for our pro team here, narrowing the gap within a 2% statistical error range. I say that deserves a huge round of applause <laughs> for our debaters who kept it timely, crisp, to the point, but made, I think, all of us see where our agency needs to go because I think all of you have proven so vividly what it needs first and foremost is agency and all of us in this room. So thank you again for doing this, for preparing so exceptionally well, for being here. Thanks to Aspen and thanks to all of you.